YouTube is more crowded than ever. Is it still possible to stand out and get noticed? I actually had a phone call with a creator that has 3.4 million subscribers. Got it in five months. What are like the first couple moves if people want to get a head start starting a new channel? At the end of the day, it's all about people. The better that you understand who you're making content for and being passionate about bringing them value, that's where you can succeed. Once I drill down into that, I'll come up with my content strategy. Hey, welcome back to the Think Media Podcast. I'm fired up because we have Daryl Eves today, author of the YouTube formula and certified YouTube expert. We're going to be talking about shorts. Is it too late to start YouTube in 2023? What is the latest features and YouTube news that you need to know? What are some strategies that can help you get ahead? But if you're just meeting Daryl, he is a father of five, co-founder of The Chosen, the hit TV show, founder of Vid Summit and uh, all kinds of cool projects. Daryl, how's it going? I'm really excited to be here. Doing really good. Fired up to be uh, back together in San Diego. Always. Whenever I'm with you, we could talk video. I mean, I'm 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 golden. Yes, <laughs> yes. So I'm fired up to dive in. Let's just kind of kick it off with what is your opinion on the state of YouTube in 2023 and some of the major changes. One of which is a brand new CEO. Oh yeah. Uh, how do you feel about what's happening on YouTube right now? Really stoked with the new CEO. I've known Neil for 10 plus years and really one of the smartest guys in the space. And he actually gets the data side. Uh, so we geek out on the data side all the time. But um, I believe this is the best time to be in YouTube. Uh, you know, it's very mature. The platform is mature. And ultimately, some of the tools that are going to be coming out, especially with live video and transactional based type stuff is going to be very interesting to see how that unfolds. What is your thoughts when people are feeling YouTube is more crowded than ever? Is it still possible to stand out and get noticed? You know, I I, I think everybody says that every year. I hear the same thing over and over again. And so I actually had a phone call with a creator that has 3.4 million subscribers. Got it in five months. Five months. And when you're, when you're really breaking it down, he's about a half a billion video views. It's like, if that person can do it now, why can't anyone do it? And what's crazy is one of the most overcrowded spaces on Minecraft, and he was able to do it in a Minecraft space. Wow. Which is crazy. Yeah, so so a new creator in a short time can start a new channel and right. still grow. Right, right. No, I, I, I do believe it's based on really understanding what good content is, like right from the title, the thumbnail, and then really understanding your audience, what your value proposition is. And so when I was looking at his specific channel, I was like, man, he's really good out of the gate. And you know that he has some pretty amazing engagement when he's getting two, three million views uh, per video released. Now, in a situation like this kind of brings up the conversation of shorts. Yeah. Was this creator using shorts? Not at all. Um, so this this is all long form, you know, 42, 52 minute videos. Okay. Crazy. Wow. Yeah. All right. So let's talk about shorts versus medium length versus long form yeah. length. What's your approach? So I think the thing for me is I actually love short form content. Uh, you know, back in the day when I was a lot younger, I wanted to, you know, do ads. And so I was always thinking short form content, like how do you really pull someone in? I think it takes a unique craft to really, you know, capitalize on uh, that moment of really sucking them into the message. And so I've been a huge fan, uh, did a consult for TikTok, uh, well, the parent company of TikTok uh, about eight years ago, saw what they were going to do, saw what was happening in China. And I'm like, well, this is going to be pretty big. And uh, we spend quite a bit of time on short form content. And I, I like for me, I think it's just a medium. Like I think there's just different formats for different types of things. And it's very, very popular, especially with the younger crowd. And I think the older crowd right now, more millennial and Gen Xers are getting more, more watch time there. Um, I think the thing for me though, is like, you know, I, I love YouTube. And um, I think that anyone that finds a way to bring the money to the creators is going to win. And right now, uh, YouTube did a really big step, which is uh, opening up the monetization program for a lot of these short form creators, changing even the policy of how you can actually be verified and be a partner. And a lot of that money is happening now. Here's the thing is the money, generally when they open it up a program, uh, generally the money is not good out of the gate. They have to get advertisers to advertise on the new system. And so you'll start seeing increases of CPMs, you know, over the, over the months and years to come, but at least they made the first step, which is 
hey, we're going to share money with you instead of just this small little pool of creators that get it. Yeah. Uh, which is really big. It did seem that even from our test too, initial revenue from short seemed unimpressive. Yeah. And so your prediction is that it's going to take time to get buy-in for advertisers to come in there. And do you think it'll be the leader in terms of platform that pays creators in terms of short form? Are you talking about platform like YouTube? versus TikTok, TikTok. versus yeah. Reels, no. Meta? So, so the thing, the thing that you got to look at is YouTube's history. So like, that's where I really nerd out. I've been on YouTube since 2005 and they repeat history. So when you go back, why YouTube was successful is in 2007, they introduced the partner program. They 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 put it out yeah, very specifically with a few creators and then they opened it up for everyone where you could actually be part of the partner program. And even at that time, uh, CPMs weren't that good, but it was better than anybody else. Like it was basically, you know, a way to uh, share revenue where no other platform was doing it at that time. And so as that matured, um, you know, you're able to see uh, more monetization opportunities and more business opportunities for creators. And now it's at really a mature level. Now the difference would be is what value actually YouTube brings the creator. So YouTube goes out and finds the advertiser and the advertiser gives the opportunity to advertise on the platform. That's the other side of YouTube that they've been cultivating for a very, very long time. And what really took it, uh, I would say up 10 notches is when they started YouTube TV because they were taking traditional money that was on television and now starting to integrate it onto YouTube. And also, hey, we got this huge packet buy where you can buy on long form, you can be on t uh, YouTube TV, but also you can be on shorts. I mean, it's a it's game over, yeah. you know? And so that's, I think that's the, the thing that a lot of people don't talk about. Just sharing revenue is one thing, but it's getting the advertisers to want to be a part of it and actually put their ads on your videos. And so staying on the topic of kind of shorts versus long form, if you were a new creator, what video length is best? Should you embrace all video lengths or be thoughtful about going extra long, closer to an hour, eight to 12 minutes, shorts, or a mix of all, especially if you're just starting? Yeah. So for me, I like to take a step back and really try to identify the potential viewer or I, I call it the viewer avatar, right? Of who I want watching my videos and what value they're going to actually find from the videos. And then I would actually do a lot of recon and research to see what's out there. Like what, what type of content is engaging with that type of uh, viewer avatar? And then once I once I drill down into that, I'll come up with my content strategy. And content strategy, of course, it might be a multi-format uh, strategy or it might just be long form. It might be short form. It really depends on the goal that I'm looking to achieve. Uh, for me, it's just more, can I create value for that potential viewer that uh, YouTube could say, oh my, oh my gosh, they liked it. They started to binge watch it. There's more people like them. So let's go ahead and serve them, you know, more suggestive views or get them on the homepage or even on trending. And let's see if we can really grow and build this. And so for me, that's kind of the step that I look at first is the who. And then I go into the what, because the what is what type of content would they find valuable? And what can I do repetitively to really engage them at a very, very deep level where they're they're subscribing for more videos? They're they're wanting to uh, deep dive into it. And I think one of the analytics that most content creators overlook is the average view per viewer. I I, I like look look at that uh, data point like a hop. It's like if I can get people coming in and really binge watching, really going through the process of finding so much value that they watch three or four or five videos within a in a given you know twenty eight days or seven days or whatever it may be, uh, then I know I found something that that can be replicated. And then two, YouTube looks at the data and says, oh my gosh, the people are coming on and it's a, uh, literally um, fulfilling with the two objectives that YouTube has, which is really simple. It's like predict what the viewer wants to watch. So, okay, if they watch the content and then keeping on the platform longer. And so if they're keeping on the platform longer and you're the creator that's doing that, it's like they're watching and binge watching and binge watching, uh, YouTube's going to see, oh, here's a pattern of behavior. There's other people with pattern behaviors like this. Let's serve your content out to more people. And that's actually how you grow really, really fast on YouTube. Gotcha. And so speaking of short form video, if you are creating vertical video, what is your opinion on then distributing it across multiple platforms? Reels right now, TikTok right. right now, and the opportunity there. Yeah. So for me, there's two approaches. Once again, it's the who, like who's who's watching it, and then, and then the what. So when I come back to the what is where's the value proposition? Now, I've seen repurposed content across all platforms, and some niches work really well. Like 
doing podcast interviews work really well across, you know, saturating across every platform because the value is in that quick little message. Are you going to go viral with those? I don't necessarily see you getting hundreds of millions of video views, but you actually get the right type of view that you're looking for and it can cultivate your brand and then put it across all, all the different pra- platforms. But for me, it's like, who's watching it? So if I have a younger, uh, you know, maybe a Gen Zer. Uh, that really, really engages with entertainment type content. It probably wouldn't work as well. I think it'd be, hey, what is the platform specific? Because like on TikTok, there are trends that happen on TikTok that don't happen on on YouTube, that don't happen on IG. And the two, a lot of 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 audiences shift between audiences. So now, let me let me use this as a, a clarifier because everyone thinks, oh, my audience is everywhere. And I don't necessarily agree with that. I think your audience is a cultivated per platform and they actually are different. I was out with Mr. Beast once, and this is the craziest thing ever. And he goes, hey, you're that guy from Facebook. And he's like, oh my gosh, wow. I, I like literally sucked down to a level yeah. that I never wanted to be. But it's true. It's like people watch where they're at, but it's a totally different demographic and you need to keep that in mind. So to answer your question, I really do think it depends on the audience you're trying to hit and, and looking at it, okay, is there an opportunity to leverage it that way? Or is it better to be uh, hyper-focused? And for me, I'll always be more cautious to be hyper-focused because I think once you understand the pulse of the audience on the platform, I think you can predict what they want at a, at a more consistent rate than just kind of blasting it out there for everyone and just kind of be hit, hit or miss on, on the value proposition. As a business owner that wants to get leads, clients, and sales, and maybe is more of a service provider, maybe you're in real estate or a loan officer or your coach consultant, what platforms would you be focusing on? Would you be myopic on YouTube or would you take advantage of some of these other platforms to get leads, strike yeah. sales? So I, I think it's like, once again, take a step back and really look at your customer avatar and say, okay, what are some commonalities that I actually have? And get to know basically demographically where they're at, psychographically, what their day looks like, what they do online, what they do offline, really get that down. There are certain uh, uh, platforms that respond more to it and it's actually easier to share is easier to engage. And so I like to look at that specifically first. However, that being said, uh, nine times out of 10, I'll do it on YouTube. And the reason why is because all the other platforms are feed driven systems. YouTube is a search and, and, and find, right? So, I mean, they basically, uh, the algorithm looks very specifically to predict what the viewer wants. And so YouTube's always surfacing your content in front of the right viewer. And so that's why I love that, especially for coaches and speakers and authors and entrepreneurs. I love it. Uh, one of, one of my students, uh, that uh, does used office furniture, Sean. Like that's that's his that's his jam. Yeah. Right. He buys used office furnitures, resells it, fix it up and resell it. And you're thinking, okay, you know, where are you gonna do it? And a lot of people would do ads and they'd look very specific. Hey, you get cheap, cheap things, go to Facebook marketplace and so on and so forth. He did over ten million dollars last year. And the only only place that he actually does anything is on YouTube. YouTube actually found his audience. People are looking for a great review and he does some really uh, great content. But what's crazy is, you know, he, he got hundreds of thousands of dollars of YouTube paying him to post content about his used furniture. And then he was able to not only scale out to one uh, warehouse, but multiple warehouses now wow. just based on the demand. So, so it's also the opportunity where his kind of core business was to use office furniture, but you're saying multiple six figures in YouTube ad revenue was it's generated crazy. I mean, an extra income stream, a significant one as well. Most people spend that for advertising and yet YouTube's paying him and he doesn't do any money for advertising. And so it's so great. Man, that's super uh, powerful. When it comes to the future of YouTube and things creators should be focusing on, a hot topic right now is AI. Yeah. What do you think the opportunity is for creators using something like chat GPT? How could they use something like that to go faster, improve their YouTube content, or save time? So I think there's different stages and I like I am pro technology. I love technology. I'm a futurist. I love things that are happening that will take us and elevate the world to the next level. I do think AI actually can change the community of any community uh, in a positive way if it's used for positive things. Just to give you an example of of how AI has transformed YouTube, YouTube was uh, in, in 2012 
an algorithm-based system. And in 2000, the end of 2012, they did an experiment where they brought an AI to try to control everything. And that literally transformed my life. And I know it transformed your life because now YouTube is what it is because it's run off artificial intelligence. And it's really, really powerful. So for me, I want to take every advantage of uh, these tools, but I think you got to know what the tools are and what they're not. If it's the end all replacement for you, I don't think that that's a very smart thing to do. But if it's a tool to enhance your research or to enhance your script writing or to enhance the way that you're processing things, it's great. But at the end of the day, you, you got to get it right. And you can come up with all these ideas and you can come up with prompts that, that the AI will actually help you, assist you. But I still think that you need to go through and do some quality control and say, is this really good for my audience? Do I need to enhance it here? You, you as a creator need to create. And the moment that you put that into somebody else's uh, uh, responsibility, regardless if it's a tool or, or a person, um, the passion's gone. And then two, I don't believe that you're actually gonna be talking authentically uh, to your audience. Are you ready to start or grow your YouTube channel? Do you feel stuck and need help connecting the dots? Join this free web class where you'll learn the step-by-step -step playbook for YouTube success. We've helped thousands of purpose-driven entrepreneurs just like you grow their influence with video. Register today for this exclusive training at thinkmasterclass.com. Yeah, so that's powerful. So you, you just can't, there's really no shortcuts to learning viewer psychology, becoming a better marketer in terms of understanding positioning of a video, having authentic passion and not just being a robot. And AI might just really reduce also quality for channels that only lean on it. There'll be a lot of garbage. And so those that are super passionate, create their unique voice, they're going to stand out. Do you agree? I 100% I agree with that. I think uh, humans connect with humans. And um, I do believe that uh, for you to, to be better prepped, I think AI tools can be great. Uh, for that. And I think even in the future AI, there's some some projects going on right now that's going to help with editing and, and get the best optimal thing. So I think it's going to decrease the, uh, the, the amount of time in the workflow and increase productivity. But to see it out, absolutely uh, erase everything. I just don't see that happening here in the near future. YouTube 2023, overrated, underrated, some different YouTube features and your take on the on these uh, playlists, YouTube playlists. Yeah. So like the playlist itself? Yeah. Way back when? Are they overrated, underrated? Okay. Should people be using them? Okay. So, okay. So th th that's a loaded question for me <laughs> because I know how YouTube operates. So I'm pro playlists, but I love when the, okay. So then let me, let me take a step back. Cause I like everyone needs to understand what's goes on. So every traffic source is controlled by its own algorithm. And the algorithm actually has a goal that it needs to achieve. And every algorithm has multiple bots to achieve what they're looking to do. One of the, one of the things that they do is they'll curate playlists, like like the AI will actually curate playlists through bots and, and bring you views. So like if you go look in traffic sources and you see, oh, playlist is bringing me views or I got views coming from this playlist. Generally nine times out of 10, it's playlists that you never even created, but YouTube created automatically. And then secondary, uh, YouTube actually creates channels too that that are attached to playlists. Now, they'll include your videos in the playlist. They'll curate it in a way that people are engaging with it, that they see, oh, this audience engages with it this way. So let's go ahead and automatically create these playlists. And so 100%, I, I love playlists when YouTube does it. And then I love it when creators curate content for their viewer. They say, hey, maybe there's three or four videos that work really, really well in this order that my audience would love. And they they promote it organically. They're, they're you know, talking about it in the video. But anyone that puts like more than four videos in a playlist, I think it's insane. Mm -hmm. uh, just because when I see like at the end of a video, like, oh, here's a playlist with 165 videos. I'm like, I ain't watching that. Right. Like, why would I want to watch that? Got it. But maybe three. Maybe yeah. four, you know, depending on the size of the of the of the video. So a lot of people are probably using them wrong. I would say that they have good intentions, but they're wasting their time because they're not using it correctly. Yes. Overrated, underrated YouTube stories. Once again, it depends on the who. Like I, I, I get really specific. I think it works really well with certain type of markets. It's really bad with others. It just really depends on the, the who. I would say not the biggest fan of stories. I think it's just like everyone came out with stories, you know, and they're really trying to captivate. I would rather do a short than a story any day. Overrated, underrated YouTube community tab. 
Okay. Communities have needs so much help. It needs so much help. I think it's uh, definitely overrated. It can still be used uh, to pull content out. Like one of the features I love is if I'm trying to really understand my audience better is just do these small little micro quizzes. Yeah. You know, surveys. It helps me with the, the data there, but I, I can think of at least 50 different things I could do with that to make it a lot more better. Do you think yeah. YouTube will be continually making community tab better? Um, I think they're at the crossroads right now of, you know, trying to understand what their platform is, what it's not. I think as uh, platforms mature, I think they're going to be more aggressively of how to make creators more money. Uh, Neil, the new CEO, has like been obsessed with that because he goes, hey, if we make them more money, we make more money. Let's figure out the best way and really pull out any obstacles. And so I think it's going to be more transactional based and you're going to see a lot more uh, membership features. So like, I think community tab can be amazing if one of the tab is really where they can post uh, uh, more like courses or membership uh, differently than just in the feed for everyone. Overrated, underrated, super long form content on YouTube. Some of my friends like Lewis Howes and Evan Carmichael are doing two, three hour long videos. Yep. And yep. get and just crushing. What do you think? Uh, once again, I think it comes back down to who's watching it. I mean, I listen to three hour podcasts quite a bit. Yeah. And sometimes watch it, you know. And so it's just like it depends on that factor. But I can tell you this YouTube back in November brought out a report on podcasts. It is the number one podcast a platform in the world. It, it it hands down beats Spotify like almost three to one. You know, and and so just saying that those are only two minute, three minute videos, I don't think that's necessarily correct. I think it's uh, there's a huge opportunity for long form. And then two, um, I think it's really important for people to really understand where the value is that they're bringing the viewer. And sometimes it is these interviews that are going to take longer than just, you know, 12 minutes or whatever. Overrated or underrated live streaming? Oh, live streams like way underrated. It's like the the best. I've been more excited about live streams than anything else on YouTube. Why is that? It's just is. It's a way to elevate your brand to a level of authenticity. Um, there's a difference between a perfect polished video that you put out for everyone, but when you go live, you know, I, I, it, it's just crazy how you can connect even deeper with your audience and there's a sense of community. Um, let me just give you a perfect example. One of my students, she was ready to give up on YouTube, like literally ready to give up on YouTube. And I'm like, why are you going to give up on YouTube? Like, this is pretty lucrative for you. I can see how much money you're making. She goes, well, I hate what I do. And what she was doing is lagging videos. She would do lagging review videos. Like any leggings that you can possibly go. I go, well, the way I see it is your your channel's more fashion and you're only working on this one little thing that you're getting a mixed audience. You're getting both male and female because guys like looking at girls in leggings, whatever <laughs> it is. Like, you're not doing it right. But I says, if you really gear towards, you know, the female, like a teenage female that really loves fashion and what they're into, you can really... It, you know, explode. And so as she was able to shift her strategy to that, it was doing more relevant things just in the fashion space. She was getting like 20 X more, more views. It's just like, it's just so engaging. Now, one of the biggest thing of connection is people will love your videos, but if you can jump on live and interact uh, with them, it goes even deeper. And so once a month, she jumps on with her, um, with her fans and answers questions, opens up, goes, does a little tour type stuff. It's, it's not the perfect polished uh, videos or anything like that, but, um, and, and to they're not getting as many views per se, but the, the, I, I would say the community has grown, uh, grown so tight because of that, that they're anticipating the next video. They care about what she's doing. They can't wait for the, the next live stream, you know, and it's a, a great way to, to give back to, I think it's to acknowledge the, the people that brought you there. One of the books everybody watching should read is your book, YouTube Formula. I know you're also a learner, though. What are some things maybe that you think are essential reading or audiobook listens for people that want to develop? Well, YouTube secrets, right? <laughs> Second edition. There you go. There I know. And uh, but in terms of maybe developing the marketing mind, or maybe some interesting things that people wouldn't expect that maybe you've loved that's helped you become a better creator. Yeah, I'm. I'm obsessed with learning. Um, I think you know, understanding the psychology of people will help you make better content, you know, predict what they're, what they're looking at. There's a list of books that I can give you. I think the biggest thing would be, uh, never split the difference is, um, probably one of the best psychology books I've read that helps you understand mindset and how to, um, you know, really get people to consider certain things and to take action in certain things. The second thing uh, is persuasion. Mm -hmm. And I think persuasion's a really solid book on, 
understanding how to set up the the ask before asking about it. I know these are more sales related books. Yeah. But isn't, you know, video content really sales content? Totally. And it's really keeping them, hooking them in and really understanding how to how to predict it. One thing about persuasion that we found is there's techniques that that we use in audience development that kind of peppers in curiosity that leads to, you know, more engagement. And then also it's more audience development in a way that's like hyper focused. Let me give you a perfect example. One of the channels that we own is Matt's off road recovery. It's it's my partner does these outdoor recoveries, you know, in his Jeep, you know, helping people get out get stuck or what get unstuck or whatever. It's also, we build our, our fleet. So we're building our fleet or whatever. So he decided to build the world's largest, um, off-road wrecker. Okay. And, and so as he's building it, he's, he's saying, you know, maybe I was thinking about doing a, a competition. What do you guys think? You know, just engaging with the viewer and they're like, yeah, you should do it. And like, who, who, you know, these are the, the creators who should be a part of it. Well, we just did the biggest of, uh, outdoor event in Utah. Wow. Just, just uh, uh, the, biggest the biggest outdoor event in, in Utah. Utah. Yeah. And, and it was our event. We, we basically persuaded people that we were putting this on were the bigger, biggest YouTubers that have these records are coming and competing. And, uh, it was amazing. It was like literally amazing. And it was all done because the community wanted it. Number one, number two, it was a persuasion technique to help them because we were going to do it anyway. You're kind of like planting seeds to exactly. get to ramp up to exactly. it. Exactly. Got it. And so they're more apt to, you know, take four days off their, their life to come watch, you know, outdoor vehicles, rock call and yeah. to do these recoveries in some pretty uh, crazy areas. That's awesome. Final question. So it can feel overwhelming to start a YouTube channel. Um, there's so much to learn and know. You and I have been hanging out at events like VidCon. You've been on since 2005. I, my first channel I ever started was for my church in 2007. So it's funny because uh, what have you been on YouTube? 18 years. Yeah, yeah. Is that, I mean, from the beginning. Yeah. And so, you know, it, a lot of the stuff comes natural to you, but there's so much to learn. There's so many details and the algorithm and the whole thing could be overwhelming. And if someone's listening to this podcast, they're, they're plugged in, they're learning, but yet it still can feel overwhelming. There's a lot of competition. What are like the first couple moves if people want to get a head start starting a new channel yep. that maybe most people wouldn't think about? Yeah, it's all about people. Like at the end of the day, it's all about people. The better that you understand who you're making content for and and being passionate about bringing them value, that's where you can succeed. I think a lot of people are looking oh, I'm going to do this because it has a whole bunch of views or it makes a whole bunch of money. I'm like, is that the best thing for you really? You know, it's just looking at what you're passionate about. And then is there an audience that actually exists online, which nine times out of 10, it does, you know, it just, it, it basically does. And can you pr provide value to that audience? And I think if you do that, I think you can succeed. And so uh, my quick tips is to really understand who you're making content for, uh, do recon and research to see, you know, are there communities on YouTube? Are there communities on these other social platforms out there? What are the videos that are really performing, you know, that have a whole bunch of views in the last six months? I really look at um, really high views, low subscribers that just tells me the topic is really good or there's something in that video is really engaging. I like to curate uh, outside of my own uh, vacuum chamber, what channels and videos are performing really well. And then I like to analyze, like, why do they choose this title? Why do they use this thumbnail? What are the patterns of the hook? Are the hook the same? What type of video are they shooting? Is it raw? Is it authentic? Is it multiple camera? You know, where's, where's the uh, production on it? And then I try to really look uh, through a lot of the comments to see where the like a, a small subset of viewers, you know, being engaged so much that they take time to actually leave a comment. And I want to see, hey, is this really hitting with the same value proposition? If I ever see a time code, I'm like, okay, that's gold for me because something really touched them enough to time code it. A time code from someone else exactly. leaving a comment. Exactly. Exactly. And so for me, I'm looking at all those things and then I and then I take a step back and say, okay, if I'm creating content, here's all these ideas that work in the last six months. Uh, around the same vein, can I create content in in a unique way? And what's my unique value proposition? What's going to make me stand out above every everybody else? Like, because if you're going to just rehash everything else, and you're not bringing your own uh, God, you know, given you know gift that God gives everyone that that individuality of your content, yeah. then I think you're going to miss out. And I think a lot of people uh, miss out because they either 
try to say, oh, I'm going to create content and they don't even think of the viewer. They just create content and they don't really look at it through the vein of someone watching it. And I think that's uh, a huge mistake. And then two, I do believe that a lot of people look to outsource to someone and say, okay, go ahead and do that. And I think that's a big mistake too. I think you mm-hmm. just need to see, hey, I'm passionate about this. This is what I'm going to do. And I've done my research. Now I'm going to actually grow by making the most valuable content for this specific niche. Daryl Eves, bringing the fire. And of course, check out the show notes for all the lists of the books and resources, as well as what do you want to shout out? We'll link everything up in the show notes. How can people follow you? Oh, what, are you what are you working uh, on just, right now? Yeah, DarylEves.com pretty much is my whole life right there, like everything I do. I think the big thing for me is I actually, uh, like you said, I was co-founder. I am co-founder of uh, The Chosen. We're just getting ready to start shooting season four. So if you haven't seen it, it's pretty amazing. You can just What's been it. the reach of this project? Uh, half a billion so far. Of Half a billion people. View, viewers of watching viewers, it, some yeah. Amazon, Netflix. Yep. Some of the seasons are on YouTube. Yeah, Peacock. And Peacock. It's crazy. Just absolutely crazy. wild. So The Chosen, of course, you could check out. And then and you Chosen, also, Chosen.tv. If you go there, you can find all the all the details. Amazing. So check it out. Of course, you can connect with Daryl. We'll link it up in the uh, show notes. Daryl Eves, thank you. Thank you.